Wednesday, March the 2nd, Ash Wednesday. And it is um, finally a green day in the market. And I think that really has to do with some of the stuff with the Fed related to uh, the Senate hearings. They're actually going okay. And it's really fascinating. I'm still watching it and we still have, right now he's before the House, tomorrow he'll be before the Senate. And that is probably gonna drive the markets. Um, but we are gonna talk about that a little bit. Um, let me share my screen. And let's do our typical format of just looking through things a bit. Finviz, if you ever want to sponsor me, I'd be thrilled because I do love your visuals. <laughs> um, okay, so this is Finviz's visual of the market. We can see almost every area is green. Energy, occasionally that gets clobbered. I am still a bull energy. And quite frankly, we have gone through the macro over and over again. I apologize if I sound like a broken record, but I truly, truly, truly do believe that you should have some exposure to commodities right now. And you can do it through the equities because the market has been so much so brutalizing um, the, um, here, I'm gonna go back to my regular camera. It's doing some kind of weird disconnect. So maybe that'll actually help a little bit. Um, but the market has been absolutely, absolutely brutalizing these poor commodity, um, these com poor commodity guys. And so um, what um, hopefully will transpire is that that will, the equities will finally um, become something that we can start to see match um, what is actually happening in the marketplace. Okay, hold on. Do the share again so you guys can still see things. Okay, so um, everything is green. We can see all the major indices are up. Um, as far as the economic calendar goes, whoops. We are still looking at one more day of Senate hearings. You've got some um, other numbers coming out tomorrow, PMI. ISM service numbers, that's really on the manufacturing side, but with the war uh, pending and the such, um, the that is really kind of secondary on the back burner, so to speak. Um, what I would mention is a bit important for all of you guys to kind of keep track of and note is that in the Senate hearings, they talked a bit more about some of the things that we've been talking about, which is I'm so glad to hear it because CNBC only seems to want to talk about the commodity prices as they currently stand, which is like the fact that Russia exports so much wheat and they export so much oil um, and they fail to talk about some of the other bigger problems that we're seeing there, which is that, um, you know, like the price of commodities isn't just driven by the current spot price, but it's actually as well just as important. What is the pricing going to be for next season? Um, this war that has transpired, and I have very strong feelings about it, so I'm trying to be apolitical on this. This war is basically happening during planting season, okay? Like this would be the time of year that the Northern Hemisphere would actually be trying to um, start buying fertilizer with the intent of putting it onto the ground and getting it a certain way for planting season. This couldn't be poor timing for these things to happen. And that is something that people continue to get confused about. As you know, we have actually talked about it for some time. Let me go to those slides again. Um, Want to just show them one more time on fertilizer. They quoted actually in the Senate hearing 60% of fertilizer. I have mixed feelings whether that number is perfectly correct. They're, they're quoting a, a particular report. I'm going to review it because it, it is really, really high. Don't get me wrong. I'm not denying that, but I'm not, not sure how they're exactly getting to that number. So I just want to make sure um, when I look at it, there are three things that go into fertilizer, nitrogen, potassium, potash. Um, Russia is not really an exporter of the phosphate portion, which is um, the potash port part. Um, and then, oh, sorry. Let's see. They are, however... Um, a huge um, exporter of um, nitrogen, particularly to, by the way, particularly to Europe, 
okay? Because they would be the closest country in proximity that actually produces that nitrogen. India, I mean, obviously could produce and export it, but again, India had a pretty bad monsoon season last time, and they are probably mostly interested in trying to refresh their stores. The United States, we export all over, so that's not a bad. The company that does nitrogen is CF uh, Industries. I. I'm a little less bullish nitrogen, even though it is the major component of fertilizer in the NPK um, among the majors. The issue just is because to really truly understand that dynamic, you do have to appreciate the natural gas, the, the relationship between um, ammonia, uh, nitrogen, and that gas. So it's not actually a perfect science, but in this particular situation, it might be irrelevant to be, to be fair. So I am actually long CF via the options. The options calls are not trading crazy. So we, um, but I'm not, today's such a weird day. I'm not gonna come out with um, call spreads to show you guys in the, on the immediate. If you are interested though, please, please, please consider putting your options out past planting season um, and uh, starting to see the crops. And that would be to look at dates that are in August or um, September. Okay, because then you will be free and clear of a few quarterly reports as well as um, it's just, you know, you can delay parts of how you deal with your crops, but it's still mother nature. I mean, like, you know, farming is a very old industry and there's only so much you can do in spots to kind of delay stuff or what have you. So, so just realize that that's not anything other than just growing up in farming country, find yourself your favorite farmer and ask them the questions that you have. Um, the other thing that they definitely do export is, oh man, I gotta just put these in order. Potash, sorry. Anyways, potash as well, um, Russia, 9 million, et cetera. So just realize that. Okay, cool. Um, that is, uh, you'll notice too, it's very interesting when you see these, uh, when you see the the tariffs or the sanctions or what have you that are being put on Russia, the two areas where there really aren't sanctions is natural res is pretty much all of natural resources. Not really two areas. It's everything from this fertilizer to metals that they produce and really are in such shortage that all we do is be kicking ourselves in the face and also um, oil and the such. And um, there, I just wanna remind you guys, um, because I think this image is very telling, but at the same time, I do think sometimes it's a little bit hard to take in everything we're saying all at once. I love this data visualization because it shows you who makes oil versus how much do they consume. So here again, we are the United States. We produce a ton of oil we also consume a ton of oil. Luckily, our neighbors to the north produce a ton of oil, but don't use all of the, the oil. So we do get from there. Also, our neighbors to the south produce a ton of oil, and we get it from there, and then all of Latin America. Um, this is actually very important for any person that is a student of history to really understand, especially if they're going to start talking about war, because again, just to share with you, if you're a political science major or anything like that, you're going to talk about logistics and you're going to talk about where are the natural resources as relates to energy so you can fuel your military and then where is the food, okay? So these, so if you're hearing commentary that doesn't seem to acknowledge either of those things as an issue, that's where I would just be very careful um, when you're listening. Again, look at Russia, okay, and then look at um here and then look at these countries over here and then if you're trying to and, and india and if you're trying to understand um given that uh, food stockpiles are down aggressively why countries might be behaving the way they are um realize that there's all this propaganda and there's all this warmongering and there's all these things that we're trying to talk about at the same time these world leaders do have to feed their people and keep people warm during um what's been a very weird 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 climate period and and so um you know um, I guess the other topic that's been talked about in these congressional talks is really whether it's going to be short or a long uh, protracted um, a war and, and how that might play out. Uh, right now, Jerome Powell mentioned that interest rates are going to be increased and we are seeing the uh, yield curve finally respond correspondingly um, such that the back end is now at two and a quarter. 
really we're looking for two and a half and above for it to be really exciting. But at the same time, rates will rise at this point. That's not a question is how many times will it rise? Um, he stated that the equity markets are pricing in five to six times at this point, which makes sense because pretty much every analyst is trying to say it'll rise five, to six, uh, they'll, they'll do five or six increases. Um, he said that the major thing that we will have to watch for is how this transpires, because this does potentially um, create issues. Do you know what I mean? His main uh, goal as the Fed chairman, his, his main job as the Fed chairman, let me say it that way, is to help stabilize prices and you know take care of American interests first. If some things happen you know, here that actually affect us, the Fed will still need to remain somewhat nimble. And there's all kinds of commentary associated with that that never takes into consideration the fact that we are a huge producer of natural resources. We have a lot of assets on the balance sheet. Now, it's not just debt, my loves, and all of that. Now, um, a couple of things that I did want to talk about, if you're like, what is probably the best um, or a reasonable play or one that I should consider sooner than later. It was very interesting to me um, um, what folks were talking about as relates to timing on this, this situation that we've got going on in Europe. And I will remind you guys that I believe that this idea of what it means to be a reserve currency is still um, gonna be talked about. It's, it's something that is still coming out it is primarily, um, I think that World Changing Order, which is a book by Ray Dalio, a man that I absolutely, absolutely respect, spins this reserve currency in a particular way that I don't necessarily agree with. Um, he, his spin on it is that debt will necessarily um, decrease America's position as the reserve currency. He is effing brilliant, but I am shocked given that I know he knows better, that he's not also discussing you know, the other side, the asset portion of the balance sheet, which is a real thing, especially if you're going to war, because metals matter, you know, steel production matters, mining matters, um, energy matters, all that stuff actually matters, okay? And and the the inflationary or the effect on the, on the world commodity prices of all that and what it actually could do for America also matters. Food supply matters, and we are a net exporter of food for the most part, so all that's, and we definitely are able to export uh, fertilizer overseas to help with some of these demands. Um, anyways, no, I, I'm not sure why the book only wants to give that one side because I know that man is effing brilliant, um, but that is the story they're telling. The other story that they're not telling that is a little bit troubling to me is they act like the euro as 20% isn't at risk as a reserve currency. But the attacks on the euro, and I shouldn't say it attacks, that's the wrong word. The changes globally that have happened over the last five years have weakened uh, the position of the euro by a lot, not by a little, okay? It's very, very strange to me uh, that, you know, everybody talks about China and the potentiality of, its, uh, of it potentially causing some kind of grief to the U.S. as a reserve currency, but I, at least here in the U.S., we don't hear as much about how the rise of China, especially since China now has the entire belt and road, I'm uh, sorry, um, uh, what you call it, this initiative um, that they've done to basically shore up all the ports basically uh, within Europe, um, since they have more or less completed it, or at least made so much progress, it's not even funny. Um, it's very interesting to me that um, everybody focuses on China, but no one focuses on the decline of the euro. Here we go. Belton Road. Um, they, these ports give them specialty um, tariff, special, all kinds of special things, let me say it that way, and, and to bring um, goods from China over to Europe, we don't have this, so let's just call it what it is. Um, so, so there's that. And the reason that matters, um, and the reason I care about that is the, the impact is really a very big net positive to Beto Bitcoin. Um, now, some, of, some folks are already talking about the idea that these sanctions on, um, on Russia, you know, um, is it being transactioned? But I, I feel like all of the commentary is very, um, 
short-sighted. I don't know another way to say it because everybody's focusing on, oh, this uh, crypto is a horrible, horrendous thing. None of them are really focused on the fact that the Ukrainian citizens coming out don't have access to their capital. And we can pretend all we want, but um, you know, I don't think they're getting their money out of Ukrainian bank. I'm just going to tell you what it is. I've told all of my friends to take as much money as they can out of the ATM just for safety. Um, if they are, if their only banking uh, options are Ukrainian banks because they're they're fleeing, and to put it into literally any um, other bank that will that is a, that is allowing them to open an account, um, Revolut is probably one, but I don't cover it. It is a bank um, that does uh, that the Nomad community, which I belong to. Um, does in fact use, but um, you know, I think what it really, really suggests to any country or group of individuals that um, it really suggests that you, if you're, if you're a reserve currency and there's some kind of issue going on, you probably want to use um, crypto as much as anything else from it, and and the desire of individuals to use crypto is as much as anything else a real consideration for any country that is not one of these reserve currencies to go and and reserve that currency on their balance sheet okay i'm talking about if you're an asian country if you're an african country if you are a south american or central american country it's a real thing additionally um given what's happening in europe if you have this as a reserve currency and you're looking at a country that has limited to no ability to put to put on and solve their energy issues right now, but they've already, you know, we've got this conflict going on. Let me say it that way. And also, this is, these are all countries in Europe that do not produce their own food supply, and you're holding euro as a reserve currency. I think you're starting to look for other potential currencies to hold as your reserve currency. Right. Um, okay. And so that brings me back to Beto. Look, I would, if you're just a small time investor, you don't want to be watching these options. They freak you out. Options freak you out. If I've, I've said for many, many episodes, Beto is a great uh, ETF. The ETF provider pro shares is a legit pro share. You know, they will probably be doing exactly what they're supposed to do. This ETF thus far has followed BTC, the future to a T. You can absolutely get this and put this into your uh, 401k IRA, if, 401k if they allow you to manage it yourself, IRA if you are managing it for yourself, just sit, set it and forget it because this has geopolitical turmoil probably has a lot of people thinking, I ought to have some Bitcoin just in case the, you know, it, it hits the fan, so to speak. This is, I'm going to give you an example of a way to do it. I prefer right now with all this market volatility to go out a little bit. If you wanted to do it at the money, you could do the, you could buy the 28s, sell the 35s. You would do that for $2.18. This would give you a $4.75 max gain. So you'd be risking $225 per contract pair to get $475 per contract pair. Your break even is $30.18. Now, if you go deeper in the money in this direction, you'll pay more, but you have a little bit of buffer just in case this wild market decides to take Bitcoin back down to 25 before what I believe it will trade up. The issue is that this is 212 days, so we're talking about September. The longer this war is protracted, Bitcoin probably is biased in the upward direction. Alternatively, if you don't want to absorb but these options, even though they are a great way to buy it off of lower capital, they're going to absorb the volatility. Okay, right now the volatility is 67.8% in the September contract. It is not crazy for these options volatility uh, when you've got very particular reasons that are happening to drive all the way up to much higher. And then it just depends on the sh what's called the shape of the smile. Don't worry about that too much. Uh, but but you can see contract prices move in a very strange way thus far. This, largely speaking, across all parts of the options chain has traded very, very well, meaning these spreads are not that wide. Meaning the price that's the mid here, this $2.18, usually you're very close to that price. You don't have these spreads that are crazy. I mean, this is 190 to 245 but if you put in a limit order, always, always with these kinds of things, you're not going to get hit in a crazy, unbelievable way that makes you think, what just happened? I just got my face tore off, okay? Um, so, but, um, but I just wanted to point this out. Um, 
you know, I think everybody would benefit from having a little bit of diversification in their portfolio. If everything you're looking at is US based on your screen and you wanted a little diversification, um, Europe to me is not necessarily the right way to do it because if they do have either their food or energy supply cut off, just think about what that means for Europe's stocks, the Euro, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It ain't great. Okay. China, you know, I, look, I'm not saying anything negative at all, but it's not really easy to get great exposure to China. So I'll just leave it there. Um, and it is only 2%, so on and so forth. Um, just have a look at that and see if it's something that meets your investment criteria. If it doesn't meet it right now, keep it on your radar screen and, and, and figure out what it is you want to do. Additionally, Gurula has Mr. Hope Smalling, who is amazing guy, very, very smart about crypto. So you can hear about like, if you're not interested in doing this way, you'd rather do it via a coin wallet of some sort. He can walk you through that. That is not my expertise. Okay. The other things that I wanted to mention today. Um, yeah, Mosaic, we're staying pat. Oh, okay. Um, I wanted to mention the following. Um, EOG, I'm going to continue on this, right? EOG, for whatever reason, because of the way the press releases were written, it really sounded kind of bizarre with EOG. And I think if anyone fundamental got out of EOG, it was just be when, on that little dip after earnings. It was really because there was some kind of commentary from some of the analysts that were listening about why aren't they buying back stock? And EOG kind of gave this really ambiguous answer. Um, the issue is that that was a really, really strong earnings report. Now, I do want to show you this map as well that was in the supplemental information. Hopefully, they don't kill me or get upset with me for posting it. But um, this just shows you very clearly that like the energy companies are no fool, okay? You see how all of it is demonstrating like they have so so EOG is the lowest cost producer of of the of the of the complex, if you will, of the oil market. And they got uh, different um, abilities in different places. And they did take the capital this quarter to do something I think was really smart. Um, all these companies have proven and unproven reserves. They went ahead and proved those reserves, which means they know it's there. They know how much it's going to cost to take it out of the ground. So now they can tell you what dollar value would make sense to take it out of the ground okay and so all these pre reserves they're they're going to conserve capital so they wait and see what happens but look at what this thing is actually drawing it is not common for them to draw and then have the arrow point to export markets okay so right now if you're confused about whether or not this oil price is gonna it is should be 110 or whatever oil executives are already thinking in their mind we going to sell this thing to Europe because Europe is going to need some, some oil and gas, right? So let's just be really, really clear about how the oil market might be looking at this and whether or not the timing on this whole situation is X amount of time or Y amount of time. Again, I would argue that you should potentially really make your own decision on how you're thinking about this conflict. But when you look at it, if peace is going to be negotiated, given how all the cards are stacked on the table, my suspicion is there's going to be some concessions and it's not going to be um, in the favor of um, Europe. And I would suggest that you review the concessions that were given to Russia to get them to stop attacking uh, the country of Georgia. Um, just have a look and see what you think and, and, and try to make your decisions accordingly. Um, yeah, so, so we continue to love Mosaic for that reason. We continue to love pretty much every company uh, in, in oil and gas production here in the US where we are the low cost producer. Um, but I point that out to you. I've said this before, we also love the pipes. They all end up right down here because these arrows that he's talking about are really pipes, you know, your Williams, your One Oak uh, and your, your Kinder Morgan. All right, um, the last thing, let me see if I did it. Oh yeah, the last thing I wanna mention is Dollar General. So Dollar Tree comes out and reports earnings and I kind of backed off of this one a little bit and Dollar Tree because the momentum traders really tried to take it up aggressively last quarter. And I was like, I gotta give this, I, I gotta stay out of this. Dollar Tree reports, uh, Dollar General reports after Dollar Tree, okay? And both of them, they trade in like a teens multiple right now. And I was really shocked when everybody traded them up because I was like, y'all understand like, these companies 
they can only raise their prices so much. So now Dollar Tree's at a buck and a quarter. I don't know if people think Dollar General's going to somehow be at a buck and a quarter, but just so you know, Dollar Tree did sell more things because people are broke. They're looking for ways to save money in this environment, even though everybody's saying that everybody saved more money or what have you. But with inflation, if you're certain, if you're certain type of folk, you're still trying to find cost savings on the off chance that stuff doesn't go the way that you'd like it to go in life. Anyways, top line was up 5%. Bottom line was down 10%. Okay. That is definition of a margin squeeze. Okay. Uh, you got, you got margin compression at the, at the, at, at the store level. And that is going, whereas before it was transitory, it was this, it was that. And we did actually get some alleviation to be fair in a couple different spots with war looming. Uh, I think that it is, it, it, we're just not, the, we got to really appreciate that if there is a war where we actually have a potentiality of being involved in a particular way, or if there is a war um, in a in a series of countries that legitimately do provide good and you know, it's gonna um, it's gonna affect the supply chain. And as such, um, I'm not saying for sure or you know, no one really knows. And the retailer has been have have actually uh, been mixed. Quite a lot of them have been doing fantastically, and then some of them really haven't been able to get this inflation under control. Uh, Dollar General, Dollar Tree, they do have the name Dollar, so it, it, pricing increases while they can do them are still slightly more difficult, if you will. If you wanted to get a lottery ticket on these, and again, I say lottery ticket because it could really go both ways. As this thing trades up aggressively, go ahead and set your strikes here. You know what I mean? Uh, Alternatively, later you can look for spots if this thing dances around because it does report, I believe on the 16th of March, you can look for spots to do the other side of the reverse iron condor on the other side. So it's essentially, you're just bit putting a strangle around it and then paying for the strangle with a wider strangle. Uh, but have a look at this and see if this is something that is in the range of what you can afford. It is $278, but it will pay out I wouldn't necessarily do it at 278. If people just want to bid up the market, people just want to bid up the market. See, just, just um, I, I would probably look to initiate if this goes down significantly under two dollars or something like that. And then I would put, you'd be putting, um, you know, whatever it is that you pay in premium at risk. Uh, and then it would be, you know, whatever the difference is between a, a ten point spread is. So ten right now it's ten minus two seventy eight. But if this premium goes down significantly, it will be ten minus and then whatever you want. I prefer to do it this way, um, just because you can get tighter up on the price. Uh, but some people will probably buy buy puts farther down. I don't love it because it's just such a gigantic sink. If it, you know, whereas you really do need the movement to go a lot more aggressively. Okay, hopefully that was clear. I'm going to hit the stop share button for a second. Are there any questions? Uh, May, on the dollar as the reserve currency, if yeah. countries are buying oil in dollars. Correct. Yes. Good point. Doesn't that, doesn't that export inflation? Does it export our inflation? Yes. Yeah, it does. Okay. You know, it's really interesting because here's the thing. And again, this is very bullish Bitcoin, right? Um, if you're a reserve currency country, awesome. You can use monetary fiscal policy to manage your inflation. Right. If you're not, it, it goes the way that you just described. Right. You're eating the, the, the major countries, um, Inflational issue, inflationary monetary and fiscal policy, whatever they're doing, you got to eat it. Okay. Additionally, with the euro, um, you know, euro USD, given what exactly it is they have to buy and who exactly it is they're at war with, it's not confusing where they would get the, the supply from, right? When it comes to fertilizer, it's us or China. China has already said it's not exporting any fertilizer, right? And if you think about why that is, they stopped exporting it. Uh, they already said that back in, I don't want to say, and it was definitely by January because we've been talking about it since January. Um, but I think they might've said it in December. I can't even remember um, on the, on, on the uh, stuff that Mosaic does. Nitrogen, I believe they announced earlier that they weren't going to be exporting much of that. Um, additionally, uh, they've been using coal and hoarding uh, LNG. Um, so, so China's 
they even mentioned, I think, that they would be happy to sell some LNG over to Europe if need be. Um, so they're happy to, unfortunately, you know, I think China might have been a little smarter about seeing the writing on the walls. For us, we are able to export those things, you know. So it's really Europe that's going to eat all that inflation. You see what I mean? So, like, if you are trading with Europe, you're looking at this and you're like, hmm, interesting, right? Hopefully that made sense the way I said it. Yeah, I mean, it's perfect like, sense. I mean, yeah. It- since you're, I mean, that's as, as a secret way to export inflation. Yeah. From the United States. It really is. Um, now, you know, we could pretend like that. It is great for the United States in a number of different ways. Now, um, some of the things that we compete with Europe on, you know, they make a whole lot of beautiful cars. We compete with those cars. Now, mm-hmm. China, Asia makes a beautiful car set of cars too that we also compete with, but just realize um, we're probably not going to be competing with those cars if there's an energy shortage in Europe. Because they sure they sure won't be able to make them cheaper than we will. Do you know what I'm saying? Uh, we compete with them um, in a lot of different machinery. Whirlpool, right? That's that has a huge. Uh, you know, it does have some production overseas. Uh, we compete with them in certain chemical products. Um, Linda absolutely has some European exposure, but you know they got a lot of their stuff all over the world, so I wouldn't necessarily be shorting them or anything like that. But um, we compete with them in a, a lot of different areas. Um, so we're going to be happy to supply to them whatever it is they need. Yeah, but China's inflation rate is like 0.9. Is that because they manufacture so much stuff at home? What you mean their inflation rate in your mind is very, very low? Very low. Yeah, I just read it's 0.9. Yeah. No, okay, no. I just want to make sure. I just want to make sure because that is really low, but I just wasn't sure. <laughs> Okay, so like the China's always tough because the, the Chinese government, because it's actually, I mean, say what you will, but they have managed economics as if they really have thought about it more, more thoughtfully. I mean, I, you know, I'm a huge fan of Jerome Powell, but he only has control over monetary policy. He doesn't have, no control, he doesn't have any control over fiscal policy, right? They definitely subsidize a lot of industries. And, and also they are, because of the sheer raw population, able to get economy of scale on a lot of stuff. Additionally, they have invested in infrastructure like mad for the last 20 years. And they've even organized their country to simplify the cost of things like shipping. For example, if you Google search uh, map of China manufacturing, you'll see that all the manufacturing plants are lined up in a way where you could literally um, make something in one place, ship it and get it back get your prototype back same day. Um, And then, I mean, the thoughtfulness with which China has organized its uh, domestic economy to make it just massively business friendly for the people because it really did have to do a series of things over the last 20 years um, is nothing short of massively impressive. Um, But also it can subsidize like crazy. Um, Yeah. Okay, cool. Thank you. Any other questions? Um, one more on the uh, the charts. The like uh, I think we 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 produce seventeen million barrels a day, and China produces three million barrels. So, on your chart, is that in a percentage of what is being used, or that's just a per, not a percentage at all? Is it just what's used versus what's produced? Wait, are doubt- you talking about little circles that I have, or or, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. or the actual? Yeah. Which, what's it? It's it's hard for me to believe that we use six times more oil than China does. No, we do. That's the crazy thing. We always have. This is a discussion that literally has been ongoing since like for the last fifteen years. Or you know, okay, so like I really probably um, even though I've been exposed to the oil and gas market for a long, long, long time. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I used to work for someone directly in this field when I was in financial services and he would have me go to these conferences. So quite frankly, be so dumb. I don't know how to say it because he was so brilliant, but he's the kindest man. So I think he'd be horrified if I said it that way. Um, and like even by the big conversation in 2008, and you'll remember that um, before 2008, the economic crisis, the, the banks went like this, and then the energy continued to shoot up for six months further. Um, 
that. And, but the big conversation that was happening thing, the thing that was actually driving the energy markets upward was the resilience of certain emerging market con- countries that were not having the mortgage crisis. Mortgage part crisis started in the United States, but uh, other countries continued to need our natural resources until such a time as we turned it into a massive global contagion. So that's that's a different telling, I guess, of 2008, but it's not inaccurate. It's There's more than one way to tell the story um, of 2008 for the global economy. Anyway, um, at that time, even at that time, China was was uh, consuming a fraction of what it was consuming right now. And and at that time, there were a few different reserves in the United States. We had not truly proven out in a kind of meaningful way. And production has gotten in a, the innovation in production has just exploded subsequent to that. Uh, but it has always been the case that U.S. consumption of, of fossil fuels is tremendous. And that really has to do with the fact that. Um, you know, we don't use nuclear in any kind of meaningful way. China does, right? China's been trying to solve this energy problem for 20 plus years. You know, even in 1998, when I was studying it um, in in, in university, well, I just gave my age away, but whatever. But anyways, it's fine, it's fine. Asian girls, we don't really age, so whatever. But like, uh, even in, in the university system at that time, we had to learn about energy because China didn't have any, and it was trying to modernize as rapidly as possible. And given its massive population, there were massive concerns, you know, even before 2000 and what that meant for the world. Um, now, if you look at China and you realize how many, uh, like if you, if you have a look at any of their mega cities and then you compare it even to New York City, it's not confusion to you that they're using a massive amount of energy, but somehow still it is less than the United States of America. As, as relates to oil and gas, okay, and it, it and you know, kind of is what it is. Cool. Look, if they could use as much, if if they could use as much as um, we we do, they'd be thrilled because they do have five times. They, the, I think it's five to still five times the population. Maybe it's four and change. I don't know, three and change, something like that. But they have a much bigger population than we have. So technically, on a per capita basis, they're using less. Okay, cool. Yeah, that's important. Yeah. How are you thinking about it? That's a great question, but how are you thinking about it, David? Well, I just, I was, the sheer population threw me uh, because it is so much larger, but they're using way less energy. Yeah, the, they're, the mix of it is different. Okay. Yeah. I mean, you know, this whole energy situation is a tough one. I, want the world to get off of fossil fuels is definitely a hard stop on that not even a question i would like to see us get off of it in a way that doesn't traumatize everyone that you know is on is is in a developed world you know we've talked about the fact that the back end of the curve is pricing in a significantly lower energy price that's come up a lot especially given this war um now hopefully that uh, invigorates increased production I don't know, I should have put this headline in there, but there was a project in the Gulf of Mexico that just got denied, I think sometime this week, like it either got denied yesterday or got denied over the weekend or Friday um, to produce more oil in the Gulf of Mexico. This administration is really aggressive on this energy. And meanwhile, uh, inflation continues. A lot of the conversation in the Senate hearing today, it was like, you know, sometimes I think, it must be really tough to be a politician because you got to argue out of two sides of your mouth and it's so painful to listen to sometimes. But the one thing that while the Republican leaders of Texas kept screaming at poor Jerome Powell about inflation, all he could really say as sweetly as he could was, it would be wonderful if you could help us to produce more oil. (laughs) Like, you know, (laughs) since that's like a fairly large component of the economy, you know, because they'd be like, you know, yeah, I I'll, get it. They need the sound bite so that they can go back to their constituents, you know, and, and, and you know, and, and he can't do anything. He, he's supposed to be neutral, party neutral. So he can't say anything about the energy policy. He can't agree or disagree. And he's got to sit there and take it like a champ. It's a real wonderful learning lesson about um, how to remain dignified when people are screaming at you, you know, so, to, so to speak. <laughs> Yeah, he seemed really dovish, but really unsure of himself. Not of himself, but of the, the whole. Of the circumstances, yeah. Right, the circumstances. I mean, right. with this war the way it is, and this administration doing a series of things that, um, 
you can't tell which direction it's going to go. You kind of need to stay and until you get confirmed. I think you need to kind of quietly and gently um, try to help where you can without hurting anyone. <laughs> well, uh, but he, uh, I'm positive he watches the bond market. Oh yeah, no, for sure. With the back end raising up, um, the bond market has done its job. I would like to see it keep going. I'd like to see that back end closer to like 3%, two and a half, three. Do you know what I mean? That would be lovely. Then it would definitely not be so hurtful if we start raising the front end like five times. But, you know, hey, that's progress. But it's come down quite a bit in the past week. On the back end? The rates, yes. I mean, I guess if you're looking at the 10 year, but um, yeah, remember, yeah, it's the, like. yeah, if you're looking at the 10 year, but it's still like steepening because the back end on the 30 year is coming to 250. So I, you know, it's an excellent point. I'm not even gonna try to deny it. We, you got to watch the whole curve. That's a fair point. I'll give it to you. <laughs> I'll give it to you every day of the week. That's totally fair. <laughs> yeah, they're jumping today. So yeah, you're right. It's really hard. I mean, the, the, cur the shape of the curve is like because each piece kind of does something the one thing we we always never want either is a kink and especially we don't want a kink in certain places because different kinks can cause problems to different parts of the economy if the kink is somewhere in the front then it causes um issues on like construction lending and stuff like that if the kink is in the middle it could cause more issues on the consumer side for refinance or even business loans that might be turned out at that rate as you go farther back the kink has a, a slightly different effect um and and um it's not you know, so, so, and, and I'm just very briefly going through, I'm, I know a true bond guy could come in here or bond lady could come in here and tell you exactly who gets hurt at which part it gets kinked or twisted. So, so just really introducing the concept, uh, go feel free to YouTube someone smarter and more dedicated to that issue than I am, you know. Okay, mate, brilliant as usual. Oh, you're really kind to say that. Thanks, guys. And um, for those of you that are watching, we are going to do a special episode on Clubhouse at one o'clock. Friends with Mr. A, for, we will put it in the Discord so you can join. And um, awesome. <laughs>